My name is Matthew Harrison, and I'm talking to you today from U Multicultural Studios, where we are recording from the heart of Canada. Will Gooden, uh, Manitoba Métis Federation Minister of Housing and Property Development. Good to see you, Will. Yeah, thanks for being here, and thanks for the invite. Um, always great to talk about uh, all these kinds of things. Well, today seems like the perfect day to have you in, considering it is the anniversary of the Battle of Frog Plains. Is it fair to say that that battle cemented Métis nationhood? I think that was the turning point. That was the spark, so to speak, of uh, nationalism, of uh, political consciousness. You know, we're obviously we're around for a couple generations prior to that. But when Cuthbert Grant uttered the words, we are the new nation, nous sommes la nouvelle nation, and flying the infinity flag uh, for one of the first times, uh, I think it was a very symbolic time, but people really grasped onto it. And it Honestly, I don't think we would be where we are today without that spark that happened on that day. So you say there was at least a couple of generations of Métis communities. Were they defined in any way or were they just communities? Which they- Obviously, at that time, um, the idea of uh, the mixture between uh, European fur traders and uh, Indigenous uh, communities was taking shape. It may have not been as defined as it was by 1816, but uh, there was definitely people there who were speaking a new language, who were making their own way, who had their own identity, who were known uh, by the people who lived out here um, as being a, 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 a people, uh, the Bois Brule, they called themselves. Um, So they were distinct enough to be known by others. Now that brings me to a big issue in today's day and age, and that's Indigenous identity fraud. How would you describe Indigenous identity fraud? I've heard it described in this way, that it is the last um, piece of the puzzle uh, for colonialism. So that if the colonial structure can't um, get rid of the indigenous people, they will become indigenous themselves. So then if everyone becomes indigenous, then what does it mean to be indigenous, to be Métis, First Nations, Inuit? Uh, so it's, it's it's been described to me that way. And I, I kind of like that, um, the way it's put, because, um, you know, the struggles that indigenous people have had for centuries uh, with the colonial structures, uh, with the wars that that were fought against us with the uh, smallpox blankets, with the actual battles where Canada went to war against our people and First Nations people, uh, and what's now Saskatchewan. Uh, you know, it it it's uh, uh, becoming a place now where uh, we're talking about things like reconciliation, which is supposed to be bringing everyone back into a place uh, where we can all be together. And now that people see that there's opportunities. Uh, whether it's career-wise, money-wise, um, academic-wise, uh, the opportunities are there for now people to take advantage. Uh, we see some very flagrant um, abuses of that um, in academia, in federal uh, bureaucracies. But, um, you know, it's, it's sad. Um, but um, I think there's a lot of people now willing to stand up and fight against it. So we're, uh, you know, our Métis government is doing that. Um, and a lot of other people are right across the country. It's primarily for personal gain, you would say. I think a lot of that is personal gain. However, you know, there's there's the there's this concept of, uh, I see it as in two different ways, that there's individuals who are trying to do it for personal gain, whether for themselves or their kids for opportunities, or uh, there's a bigger menace that's out there, and that's the collective uh, identity uh, fraud, uh, where people have been told that they're Indigenous. For instance, some of these Uh, new communities in Ontario that are calling themselves Métis with no connection to the Métis Nation, but they're calling themselves that because somebody told them they were, because somebody said they could be. And uh, to me, it's a little bit of a a shell game where uh, these leaders who are telling these people things that aren't theirs to give away, it becomes hurtful to the people they're telling the lies to. So these people are now saying, I'm Métis, I'm Indigenous, even though they had never have been, their families never been for generations and generations, but they do have a long lost ancestor from a long time ago. 
they're the ones who are actually going to be hurt because now actual Indigenous people like the um, chiefs in Ontario and others across the country, ourselves, the Red River Métis are saying, you're not us, um, you're not Indigenous, um, we don't know who you are, uh, we never knew you before, uh, but now you're saying you are, uh, so we're saying you're not. Uh, those people get upset because they've been told they are, and it becomes um, a bit of a, a finger pointing uh, exercise, um, but it's, it's sad in a way that some of these past leaders used it as a political tool to leverage uh, money and power and stuff like that. And, and now things are coming home to roost. One of the representative groups, the Métis Nation of Ontario, they come up quite a lot in uh, discourse from members of the Manitoba Métis Federation. Is it true to say there are some or one or two Métis communities in Ontario? When we look at who is Métis, I always like to put a little perspective on it. And we look at the idea of being a distinct people. And we can point to um, Ukrainians in the Ukraine. They speak Ukrainian. They have foods. They have music. They have dance. They have clothing. All the things that are very easily identifiable for being Ukrainian. Uh, the same thing can be said for the Métis. We have our language, which is Michif. It was developed here, spoken throughout Western Canada. We have our clothing, our flower beadwork that's very distinctively Métis. Um, we have um, our foods, our uh, music, uh, the Red River Jig, the dance that goes along with it, very distinctively ours. Uh, we have things like kinship, where if you, if I was to go to a community in Northern Alberta, which is a part of the historic Métis Nation homeland, I would be related to them in some way, uh, three, four generations back, but I would be related to them. There's a connection there. When we look at these communities that they say are, exist in Ontario, there is no very little to no connection to the historic Métis Nation. There's no language, there's no uh, music, there's no dance, there's no clothing, there's no political action like the Battle of Seven Oaks, like the Louis Riel resistances. Uh, those things that bind us together as a collectivity, there's nothing that connects us to them. Uh, the Supreme Court has said that there is a Métis community in Sault Ste. Marie, but I think the Supreme Court had a poor understanding of nationhood at that time and a poor understanding of what the word Métis meant at that time. Uh, the word Métis uh, in a lot of places means simply mixed. And that's where most people hang their hat on. I'm mixed, therefore I'm Métis. And that is usually the last bastion of the frauds who go out there. You look at the Joseph Boydens, well, he was this kind of First Nation, then that, then this, and then finally he's Métis because he's mixed, even though it was only his uncle who pretended to be uh, Indigenous and uh, somehow that was allowing him to be Métis. It's always the last uh, um, effort that they have in order to try to uh, sustain their uh, false identity. So I would say no. Uh, there is a small part of Ontario, what is now Ontario, that extends into our homeland. So our homeland kind of rounds out a little bit in there because those folks are us. We're related to them, the people in Kenora, Rainy River. Uh, there are definitely land uses there. Um, but beyond that, uh, I would say that even Sault Ste. Marie, where the Pauli case was held, um, is, isn't a Métis community. Pauli himself wasn't Métis. He identified as non-status. His grandmother was status. She lost her status when she married. And they used the word Métis because it was convenient and the politicians at the time convinced them to do so. So there's quite a bit of what I, again, describe as a shell game where uh, people try to... Um, use um, our heroes, our symbols for their own, whether it's a flag or real, um, but then sort of misdirect people, um, distract people. And I think, um, I think it's uh, very easily said that Métis are not mixed. We are a people, we're distinct. Um, and, and that can't be said for those communities in Ontario or Quebec or Nova Scotia, even, you know, the ones in in the Maritimes, in Quebec, the, a lot of them have been uh, dismissed uh, through the courts. They haven't won a single case. The issue in Ontario has become 
um, hard uh, with what um, you know the federal government is doing, kind of meddling a little bit in our nation um, and making things difficult uh, for people to understand who we actually are. Now, going back to Pauli, you said it was his grandmother who was who lost her status. Do you think there's any chance that there's an abundance of people who lost their status because of rules created by the federal government and who are now trying to reclaim their indigeneity in the most what they see accessible way? I agree with that 100 percent, 100,000 percent. I think that is the issue that we're talking about here is the federal government or the British system at the time meddled in identity when they had no right to do so. In their minds, they were uh, the colonial masters and they got to decide uh, the rules um, at the time, but it really made a big mess. So, um, you know, why I listen and, and I've spoken to many of First Nations leaders in Ontario and their thinking is that most of these people in Ontario who are claiming to be um, MNO or Métis Nation of Ontario, they are actually non-status. They are actually descendants of uh, First Nations uh, ancestors. And in fact, MNO tried to take some of those First Nations ancestors, make them into Métis ancestors by redescribing them, by reclassifying them, by retitling them. The chiefs themselves, their own ancestors, um, are are being put on the websites of MNO, and it becomes personal then, um, and it becomes hard for these uh, leaders to say, "You can't, you can't take my great grandmother, you can't take my grandfather, uh, because my grandfather was Anishinaabe, um, and they are not Métis. You can't call that person Métis. That's not yours to take." But they do say that. They say that a lot of those people are non-status, um, almost all of them. Uh, they may not be able to get status. So this is their reach, as you say, towards uh, an idea of indigeneity so that they have, uh, uh, they have something to hold on to. Um, and they've been told now that they're Métis. So now when someone like me comes along and says, N no, that's, you're not right in the way you're situating yourself, then the anger becomes focused on someone like myself, which I guess is fair, um, but it should be against the people who told them the lie in the first place. Those leaders in the past who um, said, you're mixed, therefore you're Métis, why don't you get a card? And by the way, why don't you vote for me when you uh, get that card? So with that perspective, do you think the federal government has a role to play here in undoing the mess they themselves created? I think there's a, a couple of roles that they can do here, and one of them is to uh, back off a little bit. Um, I think one of the things that the Métis Nation is hanging its hat on is that, that Supreme Court ruling um, is the recognition by this federal government. The federal government needs to take a step back. They need to listen more than they need to talk. Um, and they need to have, uh, I think, an understanding of how, uh, I'll use the word colonial structures, like the Supreme Court, who won't get everything right. You know, like the Supreme Court has changed, has evolved over the years on many different issues, social issues, legal issues. And I think they also need to change the their idea of, of understanding nationhood. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, um, one of its primary principles is that of self-determination. And the federal government shouldn't be meddling in that sphere. They, they need to back away. Self-determination rests solely with the nation. And if it's with a historic Métis nation, um, and if we were to say we can bring in those communities, that would be fine. That would be up to us. But we're saying they're not us. They don't speak our language. They we're not related to them. Uh, they don't have anything in common with us other than the fact that they have a long lost ancestor, a mixed background from a long time ago. The federal government needs to back away, but listen. And in that listening, they need to uh, pause, I think, in, in this idea of reconciliation. I think a lot of the 
um, current uh, word around and, and meaning around the word reconciliation uh, is a, a little bit of guilt. You know, there's been a lot of things that have happened in the past in our country that are mm, wouldn't be not wouldn't be acceptable today. Um, but they are trying to fix things really quickly and maybe they're going a little bit too far. You look at the issue of what's going on with the so-called Southern Inuit in Labrador. Uh, there's an issue there where the actual Inuit, uh, where the Innu nation who has actual roots in Labrador, they're saying, we've never seen these people before. We don't know who they are. They're mixed. They have a long lost ancestor, but they're not a nation that's been in hiding for 400 years. You know, that's again, where I think the federal federal government made a mistake in that recognition and they should have uh, been listening to actual uh, Indigenous people with who have actual Indigenous rights uh, holding uh, within their structures. It almost seems to me like there's uh, varying degrees of overvaluing definitions and underdefining certain communities. Whereas, again, to come back to the grandmother and the Pauli situation who lost her status, well, I mean, that that stripped the identity from this family. And I, I think it, perhaps it kind of left them looking for a new identity. Um, so in these communities, do you feel like there's any room, perhaps they don't call themselves Métis, but something different, but still a collective? I, you know, that's something that I've felt for a long time uh, is that uh, they're not us. In the example of Sault Ste. Marie and that area with the Pauli case, uh, they do have recognized rights. I had a suggestion a long time ago was, why don't you be who you are? Be yourselves. The word Métis is already very um, historically rooted in Western Canada, in Riel's people. I don't know. I, I'm, it's not for me to say who you are, but I can say who you're not because you're not us. Why don't you be who you are? Same as the those Southern Inuit uh, in Labrador. I, I, it's not for me or anyone else to say who uh, they are. They can say who they're not. That to me would be the best thing moving forward. Um, I'm, I'm not sure they could find who they are, but that's for, again, not for me to say, be who you are, uh, but you're not us. To bring it back to Pauli and a little bit to the MNO, we had a conversation a few weeks ago. And after that, I got in touch with uh, an MNO representative. And one thing that they referred to kind of multiple times was how the MMF celebrated the Pauli uh, hearing. And their argument is that there's a level of hypocrisy in saying, we won here in the Sault Ste. Marie case, but you're not Métis. Yeah. And I think... Um that oversimplifies uh, the case. Uh, the principles in Pali are absolutely sound when it comes to Métis rights, um, when it comes to non-status rights, which is what Mr. Pali was. There were other cases that were used um, in the Pali case, uh, several First Nations harvesting uh, rights cases that were used. Um, so if that um, logic were to hold uh, that um, the MMF celebrated Pauli because it w opened the doors to recognition of rights for Métis, uh, then the principle would apply, the logic would apply that uh, because they used First Nations rights cases in their arguments that Mr. Pauli is First Nations. So you can't have it both ways. You can't say that MMF is hip hypocritical by celebrating uh, Pauli, which again, the principles of Pauli sound. Pauli himself was non-status. But we also used uh, different cases that are, are First Nations rights and cases that are corporate law and cases that were, uh, you know, found in going back to the Royal Proclamation as well. So the body of law that has been used um, in these uh, different rights cases is extensive. Um, it's not just Pauli. Pauli isn't an island. Uh, Pauli is based on uh, law that has been developed uh, by the Supreme Court for decades uh, on Indigenous rights and Indigenous harvesting. So that's a very polite way to say it but it's only looking at it from a small piece of the pie. It doesn't look at it from um, a, a very large uh, body of jurisprudence. One thing I want to bring up is uh, another thing that's been strongly opposed by the MMF pretty broadly is uh, Bill C-53. 
Um, just a quick recap of what the bill is posted to the Government of Canada website is it is an act respecting the recognition of certain Métis governments and to give effect to treaties with those governments and to make consequential amendments to other acts. Does it come back to the lack of historic Métis communities in Ontario that creates this uh, bold opposition? Yeah, I think that's the case. Um, you look at the Chiefs of Ontario, the First Nations from uh, Robinson here on treaty, uh, lots of different uh, First Nations leadership, all of the First Nations leadership in Ontario um, working against it extremely hard, lobbying, uh, talking to uh, members of parliament, politicians, senators. Uh, we have done the same. Um, you know, the chiefs have said we didn't know these people before. All of a sudden in 2017, we have these new communities that are just popped up without talking to us um, we said the same thing these are new communities uh, that we hadn't heard of before they just popped up in 2017 that that is a big part of it if you dig into bill c53 a little bit you will see though that there is a there's a several troubling things but there's one in particular where uh, the treaties that it talks about that could be developed don't have to go to the house of commons they could be just uh, designed, uh, developed, and signed uh, through an order in council, which is the cabinet. Um, so the House of Commons, which is our representative body in all of Canada, uh, which supposedly makes decisions on behalf of um, of Canadians, uh, would not get a chance to look at it. Um, you know, they they use some excuse of a, a certain treaty process that happened in the Yukon, but it's not similar whatsoever. Um, and that was a big, big part of it as well, because we just what what you've done is you've got this self-government agreement and a treaty that is going to be developed later that no one's going to see until it's signed. And then it could be anything. It could be absolutely anything. And that scared a lot of people, ourselves, uh, First Nations leadership in Ontario. Um, people right across the country are saying, well, that's writing you know, a, a blank check and just handing it over um, without any regard to what the consequences are going to be in the future. Uh, so that, that is one of the big things that happened, I think, in there. Plus, yeah, just all of the um, all of the unsubstantiated um, evidence that supposedly is there, but nobody has seen that all these communities were there. Um, they again, there's no connection to us, no connection to the nation. One thing I think is worth noting that I took particular interest in is that the Métis Nation of Ontario disputes any community, any Métis communities which exist east of Ontario. They'll say there's nothing in the Maritimes, there's nothing in Quebec, but everything in Ontario has historic Métis communities in it. Um, I thought that was very interesting. <laughs> That's an inconsistency. I think uh, that, uh, uh, you know, if you were to dig into it a little bit like you have, uh, there's um, a, a Métis, an MNO community in uh, along the Quebec border. They call it Mattawa. Um, and there's a river that dissects uh, uh, Ontario and Quebec. The same people, the cousins, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunties live on the Quebec side. But they're not uh, a Métis community because they live in Quebec. I think it's a, they know it's a political albatross if they were to say that Quebec has some um, MNO or some other communities in there because it would be a way for us, uh, for the actual Métis, the Red River Métis, to point at them and say, this is ridiculous. They're just doing it for political purposes, a little, a little bit of shell game, as I said before, a distract you while you're looking at something else. Uh, oh no, there's nothing in Quebec. But if you use the logic that they've used in all of these communities that there was you know some root ancestors as if that makes a nation there's like five root ancestors and all of a sudden you have 5,000 or 20,000 or 25,000 people today um, who have mixed blood therefore they're Métis that happened in Quebec that happened in the Maritimes that happened in South America that happened wherever colonialism happened there's mixtures of of cultures um so how can they say it's in just in Ontario and Ontario's a colonial construct it's not something that the borders weren't there uh, before they weren't even there in 1867 they expanded Ontario uh, in later decades same thing is in on uh, is in Quebec same thing everywhere else, that the logic just doesn't make any sense. But we need to distract people. They need to distract people in order to their logic 
illogic consistent. I think it's a really interesting point you make about the border. If you look at the 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 boundaries, let's say, of the Red River Métis, it it surpasses borders. The borders, no, there was no hard line. There was no guard at the road waiting for you to come by. It was just a come and go. So we go down into, I think it's uh, North Dakota, Minnesota, Montana, Alberta, Saskatchewan, BC, and a little bit into Ontario, whereas theirs is right on the line. Yeah. Even if it splits a family in half. Yeah, yeah, it's it's funny, you know. As we've had some issues with the leadership in Saskatchewan because they supported Ontario for a while. Even though I think that's changing right now, there seems to be a actually seismic change uh, towards uh, what's going on there. But it's be it's funny. It's like uh, you're out on the buffalo hunt. You're chasing buffalo across the plains, and but you come to this place in the middle of the grass. And, oh, no, we can't go here because 100 years from now, there's going to be a line drawn that says Saskatchewan. And uh, the buffalo hunters will be looking at, at whoever said that like, you're absolutely crazy. Like, no, that those are completely arbitrary lines. Saskatchewan's a box. Like, there's no such thing as a box back in the day. Our boundaries was where we traded, the rivers, the cart trails. Like you said, uh, North Dakota, I've got... My, my grandmother's from North Dakota. She's a Michif speaker. She's Métis, um, you know, and, and there's so many relatives right across uh, that connect us uh, in every part of our of our homeland. That's why the MMF has taken away those borders. So, you know, we, if your roots are with the historic Métis nation, with the Red River Métis, uh, you can uh, be a citizen of, of the government and uh, you have uh, the same rights as anybody else. Uh, programs are being developed right now. It's not all um, accessible, but but you have the same right to vote, uh, the same right to be uh, a part of everything that the government does. And, and I think that's the way to do it. Um, you know, uh, we never had those uh, lines that were there um, 100 years ago or 200 years ago. Um, uh, the Buffalo didn't know it and we sure didn't know it. Yeah. One interesting thing that I, I noticed while I was learning about a lot of this stuff is, you know, the, you see the Métis population in you know Saskatchewan, Manitoba, zero in the United States, absolutely zero, and it's just a matter of recognition. Yeah. Now, one thing I've heard about MMF opposition to the Métis Nation of Ontario, but also the MMF wanting to be the or self-proclaiming to be the the national representative of the Métis Nation, why is that so important to the MMF? Like I said. Um, about the new communities that were proclaimed in 2017. I, I remember sitting at a national assembly with the Métis National Council when we were still a part of them at the time, and Ontario brought these new communities forward. And I honestly think most of us on our side were speechless. We, like, where did you get this from? You, you can't have a nation like the historic Métis Nation, and then have a small part of it, which is what's in Ontario, Kenora, Rainy River area, and have that small part expand to, you know, a thousand miles or more without talking to the rest of the nation. Like, it's, it, if we are self-determining, we should have been part of that discussion. Talk to us about why these new communities should be included why our territory is now doubled in size. That never happened. So the next few years, we tried to understand. We asked for more information. We asked to be able to see the uh, registry of these people who were being brought in. Uh, flat denial. Uh, absolutely no. That they absolutely wouldn't do it, even though there was resolution after resolution passed at the General Assembly. So... Finally, we're at the point where we can't be culpable anymore in the literal destruction of our nation. If there's people who come in who aren't us, they start to outnumber us. Uh, they take over. Um, they've never been Métis. They've never been Indigenous, but they have this sense of entitlement to do so. Our nation is going to be swamped. Like Louis Riel said, I think in 1875, you know, one of the things we can't do is allow ourselves to be swamped from within. And this was, you know, it sounds exactly like what he was talking about. So the MMF really had no choice but to step back from the Métis National Council, uh, which uh, everyone else 
Saskatchewan, Alberta, British Columbia, they're all allowing Ontario to do whatever they wanted to do. So in having to step back, become the protector of the nation, so to speak, there had to be some hard calls and we left the, the Métis National Council. Um, and in doing so, we needed to be able to have a safe place for real Red River Métis to come home to, to feel safe with, to know that their identity is being protected, that their nationhood is being protected. And so we have uh, opened our doors to those who live outside Manitoba, uh, to those Red River Métis that uh, want to be represented by the Red River Métis government. We don't purport to represent people who aren't uh, uh, part of MMF. It's a voluntary thing. So if you want, if you live in Alberta, you want to have an MMF citizenship, you can. If you live in Australia, obviously you can't exercise your hunting rights in Australia, but you can still, you're, you're connected here. You're still a citizen of the nation that shouldn't be contingent on where you live. Um, so I, I think, I think there are ways that the, um, representation, the political representation of the uh, historic Métis Nation is going to evolve. I think what the MMF is doing right now is a part of that evolution. Um, it is not the best of times for us, uh, the, the entire historic nation, but, but sometimes you have to go through some pain in order to get to somewhere uh, that actually works for us. Just a side note, the Métis National Council uh, was developed in 1983, really quickly, really fast. We had to be a part of the constitutional talks uh, that came out of the 1982 constitution. So that it was like slapped together, heard it described as like a, a truck with only three wheels. So it kind of moves forward, but it's kind of real bumpy and doesn't really get anything done. Um, it wasn't really working all along very, very well. Um, so now we're going to be, we're going to need to be kind of like the Phoenix. We're going to have to go into the ashes and be reborn. And I think that's what's part of what we're seeing here with the uh, changes in uh, how we uh, govern ourselves. Do you fear at all that you'll the MMF may be ostracized from other representative groups? I, I think the MMF already is. I think uh, part of it is some uh, political jealousy on behalf of some of the leaders, uh, particularly in Alberta. Uh, the uh, past president there, Audrey Poitra, had her nose out of joint on a few things. I think it was a personality issue. And to me, to take um, hurt feelings and destroy a nation is um, not, uh, not, not the best uh, leadership. Um, Saskatchewan one's the same thing. Uh, there was some professional jealousies there. I think that the MMF has, uh, under the leadership of our president, has uh, gone from, you know, a three staff organization when I started back in 1996, where we have over a thousand people working for us in various capacities in our government. Um, we have uh, a really strong governance structure. We have a really strong uh, bureaucracy uh, within our uh, government. And uh, we have some incredible leadership, uh, obviously with our president, but our cabinet and our locals as well. So I think that the strength that you see uh, will sustain us, that uh, we will be uh, able to uh, take the shots that are thrown at us, we have for the last few years um, and uh, be able to stand up for what's right. When you're standing up for what's right, uh, it makes it a whole lot easier, uh, makes it easier to uh, take those shots, to take those blows, um, because at the end of the day uh, that that we're doing the right thing. When 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 we stand up and say we're protecting the nation, um, it actually means that it doesn't, you know, when, when Alberta worries about a little program about housing, housing is important, but it's not nationhood. And if we don't have nationhood, we can have all these other things like housing, education, which are great and absolutely vital um, and, and important for our youth, for our families. But if we don't have an understanding of who we are, uh, then, then we're going to be wandering on a path that we don't know where we're going. Now, one argument I've heard in uh, personal conversations is I've heard this particular situation, uh, 
let's say, against the MNO as uh, political infighting that will ultimately cost the Métis in the long run. And then some people say, fake, real, doesn't matter. Get whatever deal you can with the federal government, however you have to. What do you have to say to that? Again, I repeat what I just said about um, understanding nationhood, understanding this idea of being a distinct people, uh, it's important. Uh, it's what Grant fought for. It's what Riel fought for. It's what Dumont fought for. Um, we we need to um, have an understanding, though, that um, infighting or lateral of violence that some people have said isn't a very good description because if we were infighting, we'd be fighting with other Métis. We're not fighting with other Métis. We're fighting with people who claim to be Métis who aren't. It'd be like Donald Trump building his wall or something. It'd be, um, it'd be, it'd be protecting your castle. If you're in a castle in medieval times and you're being besieged, you know people get in who aren't supposed to be in. They're going to take over. Um, so it's not in fighting if we're not fighting against ourselves. One of the allegories that we've used in the past is when we were out in the buffalo hunt and we had battles, one of the first things they would do is take all the Red River carts, put them in a circle with the guns pointing out. You know, some people are saying that that's not happening here. And, and we do have problems with people behind us in Saskatchewan and Alberta who are taking shots at us uh, when they should be fighting with us. But we're not in fighting. Uh, it's not lateral violence if they're not Métis, if they're not Indigenous. So this idea of taking what you can get, and, and that is a possibility. And I think that is something that uh, the leadership in Saskatchewan and Alberta subscribe to, that let's just take what we can get. It's all about the money, uh, and we will just build ourselves up so that we uh, won't be able to fall at the end of the day. But little do they know that, as I said, when you let in the 10,000 in this community in Ontario, when you let in the 100,000 in that community, all of a sudden you've got half a million people who will completely be able to outvote, outnumber the the actual historic Métis Nation in Western Canada. And by then it'll be too late. Uh, there'll be nothing left to do. Um, and then we will be just a facade of who we are. Um, and one thing that I know that I can't look my kids in the eye or is hopefully someday my grandkids and say, I didn't do all I could to protect our people, our nation, our culture. Um, uh, I gave it away for 30 uh, pieces of silver. That's not that that's not something I want to uh, be able to look my kids in the eye and say that. One of the things that we see, or at the very least I experience um, on a pretty regular basis is people don't really know what Métis means. Yeah. Um, if people in Manitoba think it means, you know, oh yeah, that means one of your parents is First Nations, one of your parents is white. No, not quite. How actively do you believe the province has been in confronting that on the education front? I think that things are going to change now we, with uh, the new premier. Um, one of his, well, the very first um, act that he passed in, in the uh, legislature was the Louis Riel Act. And with the Louis Riel Act, it's not just to recognize him as a first premier, but it came with the education side. It came with telling the story of who the Métis are. Um, and I think that is extremely important. You know, we talked a little bit today about the Battle of Seven Oaks and some of the things that people didn't know. Um, as, why did we fight for these things? For years, that battle was described as a massacre because it was written by the folks from out east, from Ontario and Quebec, who, um, you know, looked at us as being the savages. Um, that slowly is starting to changed so now it's no longer the massacre it became the battle of seven oaks we call it the victory at frog plain uh, because it was that seminal point in time where uh, we were able to um, call ourselves a new nation um, you know i think i think the this idea of mixed is um 
I had a friend of mine, um, we were eating Chinese food years ago. Um, the Chinese restaurant's no longer there anymore. It's one of my favorite. They had great soup. But he was describing to me this idea of mixed in this way. Because you're right. A lot of people think, um, you know, mixed of First Nations and European, and that makes Métis. Even if there's somebody born today, that makes them Métis. Um, but he said to me, and he described it this way. Let's say you've got a Swedish person and they marry a Mohawk person. They have kids who are supposedly Swedish and Mohawk. But if you follow the logic that a lot of people say about the mixture, that kid would be Métis. So in effect, if that kid were to suddenly just to want to be Métis, they would say, Dad, I don't like the Swedish culture. I don't like Ikea and I don't like meatballs. I don't like anything about Sweden. I don't want to learn Swedish. I don't want to do anything there. Mom, I don't like the Mohawks. I don't want to talk Mohawk. I want to learn it. I don't want to learn about our culture. I don't want to learn about our uh, food or dance or music. I don't want to learn that, Mom. I want to be something different. I want to play the Red River Jig on the fiddle, Mom, because I want to be Métis. Okay, Th that's not how it works. And that wouldn't happen. But that is, you know, the extreme to what these people are saying. You're mixed, you're Métis. Okay, well, how, how, do you, how do you then describe the Red River Jig? How then do you describe the flower beadwork that is so distinctive to us? How do you describe the Michif language, which is, uh, yeah, it is a mixture, but it's a unique mixture of the languages that have, that have come together to make one unique language, one that's unique in the entire world, um, according to uh, academic linguists who have studied us from Europe and Asia and all over. How does that person who is part Swedish and part Mohawk start speaking Machif? Uh, it, it wouldn't make any sense. So I think if you look at the different markers of what makes a nation, you'll see our distinctiveness, the language, the foods, the culture, the music, the dance, the kinship, the political action that happened, you know, throughout our history, you know, starting with the Battle of Seven Oaks. If you're able to put that into a soundbite of 30 seconds, um, then I think Manitobans and Canadians must start to understand who we are. Shifting gears just a little bit, it's very clear to see in the last five to 10 years that the MMF has really made massive strides in property acquisition. Yeah. And it's been tremendous to see. How's that been from your point of view? You know, as the Minister of Property Management, there's a lot on our table. Uh, there's a lot happening and there's a couple things coming down the pipe that I can't talk about right now, but you'll see in a couple months, uh, going to be very substantial. We're building houses, we're building seniors homes, we're building childcare centers, uh, you know, the acquisitions on Main Street uh, at the uh, uh, Old Bank of Montreal at uh, 200 Main with the uh, uh, Wawanese Insurance Building. Yeah, I think the profile is really moving up. And then you got to look at what the Southern Chiefs are doing with the Hudson Bay uh, building and uh, with the old Portage Place uh, building. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening, I think, in Winnipeg from an Indigenous perspective on an ec dev uh, side. And, uh, you know, you can... You can have land acknowledgments. You can have um, a lot of the words that come with uh, the reconciliation. That's they're very important. Raising flags, those kinds of things, extremely important. Um, but when you know you see those footprints happening, that maybe couldn't have happened twenty or thirty years ago because of. Canadians ideas of where indigenous people should be like seen and not heard kind of thing but it's happening today and it's happening uh, with uh, some of the uh, major uh, financial players um, uh, in Manitoba and in Canada um, and and with that will likely very likely come successes so you know we're we're excited i'm excited uh as a minister uh because there's just a, a lot of things on the table uh, a lot of things to keep track of um and uh, again i need to pump the tires of my president who um, is able to open doors that have um been locked for uh, decades and centuries um so it's it's a it's a pretty cool thing to see um which is, again, is why I think that, um, you know, the 
the strength that we're building on this side uh, through our acquisitions, our uh, economic development ventures um, will serve us uh, inevitably when there are federal, provincial governments who aren't friendly. Um, but we will be established, we will be able to sustain ourselves, and we will be able to provide services to our citizens, which is really what it's all about. Am I right in remembering that the Bank of Montreal building is going to be a museum? Yeah, that's exciting. Uh, you know, it's going to be our National uh, Heritage Centre, looking at uh, a lot of different things. I know that there's plans underway. I'm not, uh, you know, in deep on what it's going to look like. Uh, but, uh, you know, can you think of a better place in Portage and Maine uh, to showcase um, the, the heritage of the Métis Nation, of our Red River Métis? Um, and, you know, one of the things that was pointed out to me really uh, kind of unique. So the Bank of Montreal points directly northwest, and that is where we are described as being. We're from the northwest. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of the, uh, we've been gathering artifacts over the years. Um, I know I purchased um, a beaded jacket. It was called a beaded scout jacket, and it was apparently made in Red River circa 1870 to 1875. It's absolutely beautiful. We had it restored by the Manitoba museum um and, and you know and i was at the museum today and i saw cuthbert grant's sword um you know i'm sure we could look at some loans of of different uh, items that are located not just in canada but around the world so i know there's a lot of really good folks that are doing the hard work behind the scenes so uh, my understanding is going to be at least three to four years uh before uh, any opening is because that's an old building lots of retrofit happening have to happen. We want to have a museum experience that uh, isn't, uh, you know, uh, an old kind of museum experience where you just look at things in glass cases. It's going to be interactive. Um, it'll be well worth the wait, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. That's very exciting. Yeah. I, I can't wait for that. Yeah. To your knowledge, is there anywhere in the country where there's a, a huge collection of Métis artifacts like that? Yeah. I don't know if there's a, every place I go, I look and I, I see some uh, Métis artifacts in, in Ottawa at uh, the, um, um, I think it's called the Nature Museum now. Uh, in um, Ontario, I, I know that there's some at the museum there. British Columbia, the Glenbow Museum in Alberta apparently has a lot of items. And uh, there's a, a quite a substantial number of works in there. And then there's private collections as well. I know there's a, a, a Métis author. Uh, he's a poet. Uh, he lives out in Victoria now. And I visited him. Greg Schofield is his name. I visited him uh, last summer, I think. And he showed me his collection. Uh, absolutely stunning. The beadwork that he's been able to find some that are like 150 years old, some that are 100 years old, but just every piece has a story and every piece is exquisite. And you think about the tools that they had at the time to make those things makes it even more incredible. So um, there's there's a lot out there if you look, uh, but that's why we're hoping to bring some of it together uh, to be able to provide uh, that one stop place where you can come and see exactly who we are. And it's also exciting to see, you know, the first thought I had when I started seeing um, all these articles about property acquisition and then you buy the the former Wamanessa place on Maine, it's it's to a certain degree retaking land that was taken away. Yeah. And and there's a there's a, a big moral victory in that. Yeah. You know, that's uh, a joke we always say whenever we have a ribbon cutting uh we're taking the land back one at a time, you know, going back to the land and the land claims, which is still ongoing and we're still negotiating with the feds. One of the things that we wanted to make sure that people understand is that we're not going to take downtown Winnipeg and just kick everybody out. One of the reasons why Real negotiated the land, the 1.4 million acres, was for the opportunity that it represented. You know, if you look at, um, you know, when the Mennonites came into Manitoba, they were allotted uh, 500 and something thousand acres of land. Um, and they struggled for several years, a couple of generations, uh, because it's it was a tough time. But they were able to stay in their own communities, uh, 
live with each other, speak their language, practice their culture and their religion. And now they are um, some of the most successful communities, not just in Manitoba, but in this country. If we had been allowed to have the opportunity that that land represented to stay in our communities, to be with each other, to speak our language, uh, to practice our culture, I can't imagine we would be that far behind where the Mennonites are right now, which kudos to them. They worked extremely hard uh, to get to the place where they are over the generations. And um, uh, but I, uh, you know, you just think about that, um, what it means, that land, the opportunity. And so now when we look at the opportunity that we could be getting, why can't we have our kids, um, you know, go to college and university? Uh, why can't we have um, o- um, the opportunity for uh, small businesses to get uh, really good financing on loans? Uh, why can't we have, uh, you know, farmers uh, be able to uh, access uh, cattle and 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 other uh, farming that uh, is important? Uh, all the things that make a successful uh, province, country, uh, community. Uh, uh, you know, the opportunities aren't only about the land. It's about the other things too. Um, the, you know, the accessibility to healthcare. Those are important things that, that uh, uh, will eventually come out and uh, be a part of uh, uh, the settlement when, you know, Canada did not fulfill its obligation. The Supreme Court said Canada did not do what it was supposed to do. It promised this and it didn't do it. So now you got to make it right. We'll get on. Thank you for coming on today. Yeah, it's been a blast. Thanks. Thanks for listening. This podcast was brought to you by Matthew Harrison and Ryan Funk. Tune in next week for another conversation from the heart of Canada.